Andy Fenton. Sir, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, brother. I'm well. Good to see your smiley face uh, here today uh, while everything's uh, warming up. Facebook Live and uh, the afternoon conversation is uh, about to occur. We should do some quick intros, I suppose. Make sure we, uh, we let everyone know what we're up to. Uh, for those joining us for the first time, welcome. For those coming back, you guys know the drill, Andy and I, from our respective industries and professions, property and finance slash the share market, the share world, banking. Uh, we've uh, we've been chatting with our respective uh, tribes, our, our communities over the last year, uh, over the last 12 months, helping out, hoping to add some sanity to the world of um, media when it comes to investing, <laughs> try to make some sense. Uh, we get together. Uh, it used to be a Friday, but now it's a Wednesday. Uh, we used to drink wine, but uh, mostly the, these days we drink water. <laughs> Hence, wealth, wine, and wisdom. It's a... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's water, uh, wealth, water, and wisdom at the moment, probably. Wealth, and wisdom. Yeah, well, there you go. Still, it's with the W's, so we're happy with that. <laughs> but uh, but, folks, uh, welcome along. Fabulous to have everyone uh, dialing in to the live wealth, wine, and wisdom today. Um, uh, should be a good conversation. Plenty of things going on out there in the marketplace. Plenty of tidbits to talk through, and uh, usually, what we do in the show is we have three sections of the show, uh, and uh, they are as follows. What's in the news? Andy and I will talk about some things that are going down or something that's popular out there that, uh, you know, we should all be aware of from our industries, things you should know. A little bit of a moment for teaching, and sometimes there's, uh, there's a few lessons that we'd love to share a little bit at a time just to build the knowledge base for you, uh, depending on where you're coming from, and also... Uh, questions. We'll do some questions uh, at the end or probably part way through anyway as we go along and uh, have a bit of a chat about what is going on. So uh, those are the three things we get up to each uh, each week and also the idea that uh, Andy and I might uh, spot a few things along the way that we might uh, offer our opinions on when it comes to our uh, effective industries uh, as we go. But um, Andy, um, anything else to add? Uh, what we've got coming up in what's in the news? But um, how's things in your neck of the woods, my friend? Mate, it's uh, it's been good. It's been uh, it's been interesting. I'll tell you about the day in a sec. But uh, for those of you who are watching, any questions that you've had since our last session last time we we did talk a little bit about inflation. Uh, we did talk about interest rates and uh, and obviously property market shares and all of those sorts of things. So if you've got the questions, start to compile them now. Uh, if we can get you on, we might get you on. If we can't, we'll we'll answer them from the chat box. So uh, yeah, Riley, well, good to have you on board. And Alison, uh, in. One of, yeah, there's Alison. Uh, our usuals. <laughs> good to see you there. Uh, yeah, for for many of you, Alison's you'll notice always, that... uh, rolling along. And there's uh, Riley. He's uh, he's always. Uh, online supporting as well so good to have you guys here give us a shout out in the chat where you're dialing in from uh team gang uh as we go let us know and uh mate you you, you might well well notice this has probably been the best dressed i've ever been on uh, uh on wine and wisdom <laughs> uh i ventured out into the busy city into the cbd and got some things to report on uh all things uh, uh commercial property actually which is uh as you know there you one go of, one of my uh, one of my darlings at the moment, and one of the areas that we're doing uh, a lot of research, and you know we're doing a fair bit of investing in those sorts of areas as well. So, going to share with you some insights uh, for some incredible minds that uh, that I listened to today. The uh, the biggest bugger, and uh, and it's kind of ironic actually talking about vacancy rates of commercial property and and the remobilisation of uh, of the economy and the cities in and around Australia. So, some great stuff to share from that. But you know what, mate? I think probably one of the uh, the the, the the most dangerous things about the the remobilization uh, of our capital cities uh, is actually the kind of damage that leather shoes do to your feet. I haven't worn leather <laughs> shoes for about a year and a half, and I, I reckon I've got a little blister that's formed on a well-worn pair of, sh of leather shoes. I think my sh feet have become pretty soft. 
But uh, that's from Pounding the Pavements of Melbourne today. So I've got to share a little bit of that with you. But uh, got a little bit of stuff from in the news as well, uh, which, uh, if you like, we'll jump into straight away. Uh, All because... right, Andy Fenton, what's in the news? Well, I'll try this, a little bit of uh, special sound effects today. Um, I can't hear that, but I know it's happening. There's the drum roll. Uh, Andy Fenton, what's in the news? <laughs> uh, let's have a bit of a look at uh, at that. Um, right. So Andy Fenton, as, what's in the news? As per usual, well, let's lead off with one of our favourites, uh, the good old Apple Brigade. Uh, Apple has officially become the most uh, profitable company uh, in the world, actually took over from a, uh, a, a petroleum-based company out of the uh, Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia. I'm pretty sure, I think it is, but um, after oil prices fell a little bit uh, because of the pandemic, uh, Apple maintained pretty significant margins over you know 2020, while people bought up iPhones, Macs, iPads, pretty much exactly what we were talking about as you and I were frantically yeah. buying our equipment to stream. Uh, you know, Apple was one of the, the big winners from this market. So not only did it hit its, uh, its trillion dollar cap and soar straight through it, uh, it has become the world's most profitable company. Uh, trillion so dollar cap. That's insane. That's so much dough. Like it's just uh, amazing, isn't it? And uh, yeah, whoa. <laughs> more, more zeros than what most of us know how to actually calculate. But uh uh, it, so it reported net income, net income of fifty nine billion. That's uh, that's billion with a B, Jason. So wow. that's uh, that's our old man here. Fifty nine billion dollars <laughs> is uh, is their reported revenue. So mate, they they are absolutely crushing it. Uh, but you know, if we have a look over the other side here, uh, you'll see our old mate, uh, Mr. Buffett, has actually cut. Uh, Apple stocks. And I think that I thought this is an interesting kind of dovetail in because they've reported to be the most profitable company. Of course, tech stocks have, have risen very, very sharply over the pandemic and have driven the US market to a large degree. But you're going to start to see headlines like this around because the, the, the media love to paint the, the bad side of it. And so let me just give you some insights into these comments here. Uh, Buffett cuts Apple. And uh, Baron uh, trimmed Tesla, and they're one of the biggest advocates of Tesla and have been for quite some time. But, but here's the thing. is So you look at that and you go, oh, we've got to sell Apple. We've got to sell uh, Tesla. Well, the reality is, is that these companies have massive portfolios uh, of stocks. And when something like Tesla did 500-odd percent over the last 12 months, that stock becomes a very large part of a of a diversified portfolio. Yeah. So these guys then have to sell down large position positions within those stocks, one to de-risk the portfolio, but also there's a, a common thing called not falling in love with a stock as an investor. It's one of the biggest mistakes you can make is that you you, you fall in love with a position, you never sell it. And you know, as we know, things going up, up and down over time and you can erase the gains that you've made. So when you see a so you're saying, like, Andy, they're, they're taking some profit off the table, they're putting it, they're, they're taking some profit while they can, and then they, they'd redeploy it somewhere else. Smart maneuver, good investment strategy, yeah? Certainly yeah, in the stock market. Yeah. yeah. But my, my sort of point here is that when you read these headlines, then they do spark sell-offs, right? Because people said, oh, it's the time to get out. But the reason yeah. why they're getting out is predominantly risk management. Uh, look, I'm assuming, right, because I don't have a direct line with either of them. Uh, but if you do want to call, Warren, uh, just uh, <laughs> whack, whack, whack your phone number in our little chat box and I'll give you a buzz. Uh, that goes for both of you. But uh, ultimately, when people see these headlines, they go, okay, the story's over, the roller coaster is about to begin. And it's not necessarily the case. As we've seen in the bottom right corner, Apple's still the world's most profitable company, or sorry, become the world's most profitable company. And even though tech valuations, so that the stock valuations, the price would be very, very high at the moment or is very, very high. If you believe that Apple is going to continue that growth, then there's probably going to be some volatility, but five years from now, likely to be significantly north. But just to contextualize these headlines, because they are sensationalist, because people read this and they go, oh, Tesla's on the way down. Apple's on the way down, but a bit of the story behind it is that these guys are taking profit and and managing some of their risk. So definitely doesn't mean that that story's over. At the moment, we are seeing some uh, some tension in and around the tech stock area, and that we spoke about last week because 
you know, inflation and bond yields are supposedly rising and they're back down again. As I said last week, they'll be up and down like yo-yos as we speculate. But anyway, just wanted to put some context around there and give Apple a big cheers for taking the first trillion dollar market cap and then Should becoming we give the them a hand. Market. Yeah. Hey, Gabriel, yeah. Give them a hand. Oh, is that? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's laughing at them, Jace. They're laughing at them. Oh, no. How about that? That's the drum roll. Oh, no. I've got the wrong one. <laughs> Oh, I, don't I feel know like I'm on a bad off. episode That's of right. Red Faces. Uh, <laughs> so just, and then this is probably more topical for business owners around and and what we're going to start to see more and more headlines in and around. Uh, but four days until JobKeeper is axed in the form that it exists, which is, uh, which is interesting. And mate, we can chat uh, long or short about this, but... Uh, it's going to have an impact. You know what impact it's going to have is is yet to be seen. I was in a presentation today where they talked about uh, job statistics out in Australia, which are phenomenally high at the moment. And one may assert that one of the reasons why they're still uh, significantly high is because there are a lot of zombie companies or companies that are being propped up by JobKeeper. Uh, so the expectation is uh, that we're going to see significant. Uh, significant uh, companies go into to potential bankruptcy and alike over the next, you know, m a few months. We won't see a lot of that because when we're, we're not going to actually see the trail uh, of those events for some time, as far as getting the information, because winding up takes some time. The courts are backed up. There's there's a whole lot of inertia that needs to be overcome. But this this is going to have a flow-on effect. So the Australia has been waiting for this to happen. If you have a look at markets, markets have been sort of up and down a little bit recently in Australia. And, and one might believe that this is one of the key things that uh, that is assisting that because it's uncertain what's going to happen. And as soon as there's uncertainty, there, you know, uncertainty hurts markets to a large degree. So it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, and a nice book end uh, or a big book beginning as far as uh, the new budget's concerned because the new budget's not too far away and uh, we're proposing or I believe that there's going to be some sort of support that's going to be coming out. Uh, well, there's definitely going to be support that's going to be coming out in the budget. It just depends on what form. So stay tuned for this because, you know, this is going to be a very, very interesting statistic that will also impact on uh, our inflation. And as as we spoke about last week, and if you want me to chat more about it, we can. But ultimately, one of the things that I mentioned last week is, yes, we're getting uh, a, a supply push inflation where the lack of supply through global chains or just distribution, things aren't getting to places because they can't. That's pushing the cost of goods up because same people want the product, but the product can't get to shore. So what is onshore is getting uh, the price of lifting up. So that yep. inflation in some degree is synthetic uh, and will normalise as supply chains normalise, so meaning the ships can actually dock and, and distribute the goods without COVID getting in the way. But one of the things that – the and and they just – actually, Jace, uh, the, the Fed came out with commentary. I should bring it on because it mirrored exactly what we were saying last week. Uh, is that they're, they're not too fussed about long-term bond yields uh, and they're not too fussed about inflation at the moment uh, and it's not because that's one of their main triggers, inflation, that they're meant to worry about and potentially raise interest rates. But they're looking yeah. at the real job numbers and the real job statistics and at the moment they believe that, you know, there's a lot to play out in that space and, and I think that there's going to be a lot that's going to play out here uh, in Australia. Don't know exactly where it's going to go but it's certainly going to have an impact. Well, certainly, we certainly see that in the property world. There's a lot of money uh, in, the, in the marketplace, like lots of cash. And uh, for the first time in a long time, the, uh, you know, the, um, the millennials uh, are cashed up. Uh, they're cashed up. It's, it's cheap enough to purchase from a, um, a cash flow point of view, a, a ratio of their incomes to um serviceability not property price but serviceability because those interest rates are so low and uh, many of them andy have taken 10 grand out of their super or 20 grand out of their super uh they've banked it they've put it in their bank account you know they've been on JobKeeper. They've, they've got <laughs> extra cash you know well um 
the the level of saving in Australia has increased significantly. And it actually happened. It, the behaviour was really interesting, Andy, on this one, was the same in uh, after the GFC. The GFC saw Australians have a higher level of cash savings in their bank accounts, and now we're seeing that after COVID as well. So it's not a bad behaviour. Uh, it's pretty good behaviour. Uh, sounds like Aussies like, you know, uh, park a little bit of cash potentially when the tough times are around just in case. So, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that JobKeeper plays out. What I do know is there's some uh, some incentives going around. There's some uh, incentives for the aviation industry and tourism. And I think uh, what we're going to see, and the government's already talking about it, is it flow into those industries to create jobs rather than flow to the individual, um, you know, to to – um, bank the money. So, um, well, yeah, JobKeeper stopped oh, people getting, like, stopped people losing their jobs. But this next section will be directly aimed at the industries to create jobs or keep the job from the industry point of view. So, it'd be interesting. It'd be very interesting. You're dead right. And look, I know it's terrible to be within the companies that are that are suffering, but it's more uh, it's more devastating to to prop up companies that are never going to get anywhere. Uh, long term, because ultimately you're backing a, a you know a horse with three legs, and uh, and it's only a matter of time until that that's just not going to run anymore. And and unfortunately yeah. for those businesses, they're called zombie businesses. Which uh, for those of you who don't know what zombie businesses are, they're businesses that are effect effectively bankrupt or cannot operate and will not be profitable after uh, co uh, after JobKeeper is taken out. And there are companies out there that are literally just banking the JobKeeper. So they're a, a, an administrator for wealth welfare, but they're mis almost misappropriating some of those funds uh, in other areas. And ultimately, as soon as JobKeeper goes, the company won't exist. And there's quite a number of them and the statistics are quite staggering. But uh, to your point about cash, Jace, there, there's never been more cash in bank accounts, uh, in venture capitalist funds in share market funds there's never been more cash in the system than what there is right now and i think next week i might bring in some statistics around it but just to talk to your point about uh retail uh when we have a look and this is uh this is a slide that talks to uh, top online uh shopping weeks ranked from one to five uh, as you can see, after Black Friday, uh, we, we've absolutely had a, a gangbusters uh, you know, trend and it's been going up for over a year, for over 12 months. But look at the, those statistics. So the grey line there is, uh, is last year, is 2019, and the red line there is 2020. So, well, it's uh, interesting, isn't it, that, that, that uh, you know, right now I, I've bought, I've purchased more things online in the last 12 months than I had done probably in, in, in the previous 47 other years of my life. Uh, so it's so, so true, Andy, like that it's, it's going to be fantastic to see this play out. I'm actually a big fan of it personally. I feel, I feel old world inefficiencies and, and bad habits uh, and wastage uh, human wastage, human time, um, human time, human focus, human resources. I think there's a big rearrangement happening, and I'm I'm actually quite excited personally. My personal life, my business life, has been rearranged significantly, and I feel for the better. Uh, and I think maybe a lot of the world will too. We've got a few people here right now. Uh, Jeff's giving us a shout out. Jeff, how are you, mate? Good to see you. Um, Craig's online. Thanks for joining, Craig. And uh, whoever that is, some for some reason, um, sometimes the chat function doesn't pick your name up. But yeah, we've all been purchasing, that's for sure, um, as we've gone along. So um, it's an but interesting hey, one. If you if you just have a look at this section here, this one might assert from this statistic. This says here, pubs closed, restaurants takeaway only. So as soon as we could stop drinking and eating, uh, we just started buying. Uh, aggressively and uh, <laughs> mate, that, not, that may or may not have been the trend but, uh, but, uh, but that's it and I'm going to chat later on about how this is actually this phenomenon that we've got here you know how this is actually potentially really going to change the way that we consume the way that we live the yeah. investments that we look for 
um, and you know potentially the businesses that we're in because it really is going to have a profound impact and in my belief that sort of consumer behavior is going to be here to stay yeah I love it. Uh, so we've got a few people online. Just a quick shout out for anyone. Uh, if you have any questions, any thoughts, anything that you want Andy and I to talk about, uh, chuck it in the chat. We'll have a, a bit of a time, probably in about 15 odd minutes, where we'll talk about and answer anyone's questions. If you've got anything that uh, you'd like us to chat about, then uh, put it in the, the chat and we'll we'll have a bit of a bit of a yarn about that one. So yeah, no, Andy. Um, interesting times out there well you know on my side of the fence there's there's a lot uh, a lot happening uh, also if we have a little look at uh, the marketplace of the world of real estate uh, have a look at these headlines going on right now melbourne's prestige housing housing market firing on all cylinders uh you know record prices 30 million dollar mansion in turak wow uh, penthouse becomes the most expensive flat ever in Australia, $20 million in uh, Bondi just now, right? Imagine that. Imagine buying a unit for $20 million bucks in Bondi. Well, Gee. people are doing it, Andy. That's what's going on. It's happening right now under our noses in, in the real estate market. You wonder what, uh, that, what that would actually do to the footprint, right? So if you say that there's 10 units in that, then and that's twenty million dollars. So that's two hundred million dollars per uh, probably square meter uh, of, of, of actual <laughs> land mass underneath it. That's incredible. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, here's one. Here's one to all those people who say, "Oh, units don't go up. Rubbish." <laughs> I wouldn't mind buying that unit that gets uh, gets valued at twenty million dollars. That'd be all right. Oh, Andy, what do you yeah. think? Huh? Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> I wonder what it costs to uh, buy before that, or is that a newbie? Is that a newbie, or is that a second sale? Uh, it'd be good to find that out. Actually, it'd be interesting to know. I could, I could probably yeah. track that down on RP Data. Uh, Mate, but that's, uh, uh, that's outstanding. Chief is creepy. Nice view, though. Beautiful view, and and certainly, certainly, one of those uh, destination locations. Uh, when we talk about real estate, a destination location uh, from all around the world. People worldwide know about Bondi, right? Um, and so there are some there are some destination purchasing locations that uh, that people um, you know pay more than they should because wow. you know they want to live there. One of those other ones is Byron as well. Byron Bay, uh, part way through COVID, you and I talked about it in, in one of the uh, Wealth Wine and Wisdoms. You know, record prices set down there, twenty plus million dollars for a for a house uh, on a nice bit of dirt down Byron Way as well. So very interesting. There is a lot of money in the marketplace right now and a lot of uh, a lot of um, pressure and demand in the marketplace. And one of the things the other day, I did a, a bit of a Facebook Live on it and someone said, well, uh, where are all these people coming from? Because uh, hasn't um, immigration, you know, been stopped hasn't it gone down and uh the answer is yes there was only a net i think uh twenty one thousand not twenty one thousand dollars but twenty one thousand people uh twenty one thousand people uh into the country in comparison to an average like two hundred fifty thousand new immigrants um or new australians uh in the past wow. you know, on, on average decade what what everyone hasn't realized andy is that do you know that's that's less people that have come back into the country than actually moved from Victoria to Queensland during the pandemic? No, 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 no. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. These are new. These are new people, right? New Australians. Guess how many Australians moved home? Six hundred thousand Aussies returned home, returned back to Australia from other places in the world, and um, that has put a severe amount of pressure and money back into certain economies uh, and we're seeing that play out and uh, it's it's quite an interesting um, thing to sort of get our noodles around uh, at the same time uh, supply chains are absolutely uh, broken and stuffed when it comes to residential real estate the interest rates are the lowest it's ever been it's unlocked literally a year uh, 10 years of people who haven't been able to buy their first home the millennials these low interest rates have unlocked 
like literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of millennials out of the renting cycle right now. And in every capital city of Australia, it is pretty well cheaper to buy than it is to rent. And uh, so, plus then the government has thrown billions of dollars at the first home buyer scheme, uh, or not the first home buyer, but the owner occupier boost scheme, uh, $25,000 for the, that, uh, that owner occupier. And that has really accelerated things to no end. And uh, I spoke about it last week. Right now we're seeing um, that fake inflation happen because these things are, are being restricted right now and that fake inflation is flowing into property prices at the moment. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think uh, what we say often is that it's an interesting time. Isn't it interesting to be in this marketplace right now <laughs> uh, as we go? As, as as all of our expats say, there's, there's there's no place like home. Six hundred thousand came back and started uh, started consuming real estate. But mate, it's it's interesting, and we've we've got the same thing happening in the commercial commercial world at the moment, the commercial property world to a degree, not to the same level. But it, yeah. you know, you weigh it up and you start going, well, prices are astronomical. Uh, they're going up aggressively. You know, is you know, is it is it bubble territory? And we get in the stock market all the time. It's a new bubble every time it goes up, and the bubbles burst every time there's a correction, uh, and then it goes back up again. But you know, it's I mean, it is that period of time where it's risk on, right? And you got to take risks to to go into the market. And yes, it would yeah. have been great to get in yesterday, but you know, investing's easy in hindsight. It's one well, of the Andy, investing easy if they would have been listening to you and me, wealth, wine, and wisdom. Hey, we were, mm -hmm. we, were, we were telling everyone this is the best time I've ever seen to buy real estate. Get in before you before you miss out. Um, but anyway, there's that I but told you so moment. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that's really, really difficult as, as it is in the stock market at the moment. It's really yeah. difficult to, to, to see through it because you go, this is higher than it's ever been. You know, it's higher based on, you know, per wage. Uh, well, not quite. Some of those statistics are, are kind of level, but it feels high. Right. And but then when you start laying up the the facts right behind it, so interest rates low, likely to be low for a while. We yes, inflation's going to happen, but it's going to take a little while for that to have any major impact. Meanwhile, six hundred thousand people came back. We still don't have borders open, uh, you know, migration coming land shortages. Like when you look at the actual fundamentals behind it, the fundamentals go there's still a lot to play out, but there's the emotion that kind of goes, oh, God, it's already run a bit. Like, uh, have I have I missed the run? Yeah. Well, for me, my call is there's going to be significant pushes along in, in the property market for at least 18 months to two years. Um, it, it, it's just ahead of steam right now. Mm. And, um, and certainly the supply chain, I, I've chatted to... Um, you know, you, you before and any and listening in the supply chain takes three to five years to to change in the Australian residential delivery system. Uh, and right now, we just don't have enough um, ability to finance and build enough properties for the demand at the moment. And that demand will continue to build for a while. And, uh, and those who happens. have got, yeah. Right. When there's a shortage, we know what happens. Just look at toilet paper. Uh, I mean, it didn't go up in price, but there were people selling it on eBay, and I think that the, uh, the powers that be were trying to stop it. But that's the reality, really. When you look at the basics of demand supply, if there's not, if there's yeah. too much demand and there's not enough supply, it it is going to push the cost of things uh, north, and that yeah. that's where it's a really interesting time. I think commercial, you know, um, uh, not quite yet, but it's got the signs of that. Uh, you know, certainly the, the the stock market is is showing signs of that, and certainly the you know the resi market here in Australia. And uh, right, it's it's an interesting story, but you you kind of think, wow, it's gone. But it's like there's potentially still statistically a hell of a lot to play out. Yeah, I, I think there's there is a lot to go. Um, and I've I've chatted to everyone about this one, and we could probably you know uh, talk a little bit about in things you should know a bit later how to lock your equity in. You know, just like what what was reminded me a moment ago when you were talking about uh, the uh, you know the the grand 
father of investing, uh, Warren Buffett taking some profits off the table. Oh, um, profits off the table. Well, uh, in property world, doing the real estate world, taking some risk uh, out of the the property is about locking in your equity as the value of that property increases. Um, certainly for investors, uh, certainly for those who want access to their capital um, as we go along. But you know, I think there's still a little bit of room to go. Um, uh, there's there's a lot of rhetoric uh, around 20 to 30 uh, percent increases over the next 12 18 months two years listen I think that's that's uh, that's pretty conservative uh, we saw that coming a long while ago but just don't underestimate this folks not every property will go up 20 30 percent that is not going to occur some properties are rubbish they'll always be rubbish and um you know they might go up a bit but afterwards you'll regret owning them so be cognizant of that, of how and what you go ahead and and buy if you're in the market um and you know places like perth which has had a 10 year decline in in uh real estate activity and confidence over there are absolutely going like the supply chain over there is absolutely cactus and it's insane what's going on in that marketplace right now. So, you know, uh, just because something's not happening in your backyard, sometimes if you if you look over the fence into different states or different cities, there's a lot going on. And uh, mm -hmm. certainly Southeast Queensland is receiving a huge amount of people um, into, into, the, into that uh, that land mass and that's really accelerating prices as well um so it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh as we go along but this is the the one that uh i might uh i might sort of roll from what's in the news andy to things you should know when it comes we're going to, to talk interest rates aren't we well yeah we i think we are because because it was interesting uh Everyone's talking about, all right, well, something's got to happen. And uh, I mentioned it last week. Uh, I mentioned it, was it last week or the week before, about, you know, uh, Philip Lowy, the, the governor said, yeah, listen, you know, we think we're going to have to do something. But what he did say, Andy, and this is an interesting one, I'm not going to put up interest rates anytime soon. So, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, well. And, but, and they, but my mates. They've always been honest, right? Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> What uh, you know? What we can learn from our cousins, uh, our Anzac Anzac neighbours. I said last. I said last uh, last week. Um, he said he's not going to put up the interest rates. But what might happen is loan to value ratios. They might reduce the ability for investors to borrow. Let's say at ninety percent, they might reduce it to eighty or even seventy percent. Or in New Zealand, what they've done is they've only allowed you to um, unlock. 60% of any equity in a property uh, and uh, and so on. So if they, if it gets to there, uh, we all must, like like we do, Andy, understand what risk going forward because, to be honest, you and I both know the risk of the market, um, you know, ups and downs in the market, that's quite normal, but the risk of irrational, brain-dead politicians making stupid decisions is actually one of the bigger risks that we face when we take positions, right? Um, and they can change rules which affect us. And if we don't think about that as we go as a property investor, that's where we can get caught, you know, technically with our pants down and not know how to uh, do that one. So what I'm saying to people now uh, is the thing you should know, as your properties grow in value, the equity lock, locking in your equity is going to be more vital than ever before so if the government changes their mind, APRA comes back in and changes some things, whatever it might be, you'll still have access to your capital. If you require access to your capital to grow your portfolio, to grow um, or diversify your portfolio, you know, whatever that might look like. So that's something that I believe everyone should be uh, taking uh, heed of as we go along. And our first bank did something interesting, and this is where we could probably chat, Andy, I think, with the things we should know about interest rates. So the Commonwealth Bank, the Commonwealth Bank put up their four-year interest rate, their four-year fixed interest rate. The Combank put the four-year fixed interest rate up, uh, but they dropped their two-year and one-year fixed interest rate, right? So 
what does that mean when it comes to economics? What uh, probably it's more in your camp, yep. this long term decision making rather than my camp. The bank is saying, all right, well, we, we want to hedge some costs. We want to hedge some risk. Um, you know, what would you say to that one, Andy, for people listening in about what they should know about that type of behaviour and, and thing from the bank? Look, normally I would say it is, it standard economics would would assert that uh, if the banks have got lo uh, higher longer term interest rates than their short term interest rates, it, it means that they have an expectation that rates are going to be higher in the future. So yes. an example would be if you've got one year rates very, very low and then you've got two year rates a little bit higher and then four year rates significantly higher, you would assert that the bank's economic position is that interest rates are going to rise quite dramatically over the next four years. Uh, and so what I mean by that is cost of money to the bank. There's a big but here, though, uh, is that I'm not 100% sure that, uh, that that is their true view. Uh, now, I haven't done enough research, so I'm just going to throw out some uh, opinions. Yes, so I haven't speculating. Done I'm yeah. just, this is speculation. It's not fact. It's total speculation. But at the moment, my feel is... Uh, is that we might see this more as a profit exercise under the guise of longer term interest rates rising, right? Because no, Andy, they, they wouldn't do that, would they? Gee, I, like they've <laughs> never they've never done that before, have they? <laughs> but so, but here's the thing, right? Because it, so, Combank has has done it. Now it's illegal for them to collude, but they seem to mirror everything that they do. So what ends yeah. up happening? You, so their market, they've got market dominance at the moment, as they always have, right? So if they raise their long-term rates, well, other banks have then the competitive advantage to keep theirs lower, get more attention into those rates so that there is a, an efficient market that keeps them, uh, I guess, straight, uh, as straight as they could possibly be. But I, my, my belief, my completely unfounded belief on this at the moment, and I'll do some research and I'll come back to you next week or the week after, but my belief is that the banks are actually going to start to play around with this and just see whether the others follow. Uh, because my, my, I don't believe that the banks think that, you know, in three years' time, interest rates are going to be significantly higher than where they are right now. Um, yeah. Maybe they do, but that's not the views that I've been hearing coming out from their economists, uh, at least not yet or not within the last couple of uh, months. Now, they may change their story so it matches up with their interest rate that helps their profit, uh, but I, I, I think that this, this will be one to watch. I reckon there might be a bit of movement in that, that medium to, to longer term fixed rate market. Yeah. Well, mate, uh, that's it from me. Uh, what's in the news? You should know. Uh, what about you? Have you got anything to, to share with everyone uh, today? A uh, few people uh, on, uh, on still right now, and um, we've got a few questions here. So <laughs> I love um, Luke's question. <laughs> we'll jump to that in a tick. Um, but, <laughs> mate, I, I just, I have something interesting from the presentation that I was at today. And uh, so it was uh, with uh, one of our major commercial uh, property partners that we do a lot of investing with today. And they had some of their research companies uh, come in today, which was ma magnificent, you know, got a wealth full of knowledge, complete third party. It was JLL and CBRE. And they had a supply chain expert come in. So not necessarily property. And for, for those people who don't know what supply chain is, and, and quite funnily, uh, as, as, as we were chatting at the back of the room beforehand, she's gone, up until now, nobody actually knew what my job was. And now everybody's going, supply chain, supply chain. <laughs> um, but this, this is really interesting. And this again, this is speculative, but there's some facts behind it. But so supply chains effectively... Uh, like simplified, it is the cost of getting a good from point A to your to the consumer's pocket, right? And so typically as we go through that, you know, the, it starts off, it gets manufactured, then it gets shipped. But between the ship, there's some sort of transport, right? Then it gets shipped. Then it goes onto a big truck. Then it goes onto a smaller truck. Then it goes onto an even smaller van and then it delivers to your door. Um, it used to be that... Uh, well, actually, it's been pretty efficient in Australia. It really has. It's only when you post Christmas cards that you don't get them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so if we think about consumerism at the moment, and one of my favourite things, as you know, Jace, has been logistical industrial property. Uh, and yes. It's been some, a big focus of mine for a while now. 
uh, one of the things that I think is going to really shape uh, the way that we live moving forward has a lot to do with this supply chain stuff. And I haven't been able to articulate it to now, but here's a really interesting, well, I find it interesting, uh, slide from today's chat. So the supply chain cost profile. So this is effectively how transport costs can influence locations and decisions. So people always assume that rent is one of the biggest costs for companies, right? But what we can actually see down here is that it actually only makes up a very, very small portion of a business operation. Can you operation. zoom in a bit, Andy, on it for us? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, it only makes up a very, very small portion of it. But the transport, the logistics side of the equation, the transportation is actually 50%. Now, in some of the conversations I was having today with the, the advent of Amazon, which apparently we feel like it's mature, but it's very immature in Australia right now. Right? It's growing, but it's very, very immature out here. And they're talking about how Amazon is its actually this supply chain demographic or this supply chain situation has companies actually selling things for negative profit because the costs of the logistics or the, because the cost of the supply chain. Because companies have had to very quickly go from retail store to delivery and they haven't, yeah. they don't know their numbers well enough and they don't understand yes. this dynamic. Yeah. But the supply chain, 50%, right, is in the logistics. And here's the really, really interesting part, uh, which is, I think, going to be great business opportunity moving forward for, for anybody who's looking at, you know, businesses to start up. Don't do it based on this. Do your research first. But 28%, 28% of that 50%, so let's, you know, uh, a significant portion is the cost of the last mile. And what the last mile is, and I'm going to get to how this is going to operate with property and, and so on and so forth. The last mile is the name that they give, quite interestingly enough and quite cleverly, it's the last few miles of the delivery because <laughs> many things go into a ship, you know, yes. potentially billions of dollars worth of merchandise might go onto a ship or hundreds of millions of dollars. And the, the cost of that transport is proportioned across all of those different suppliers. Then it gets onto a truck, which has not maybe you know hundreds of millions, but maybe millions of dollars worth of stock that sits in the truck or hundreds of thousands of dollars that sits in the truck. Again, that's amortized across the goods in the truck. That once it goes past our parcel post and, and goes from a distribution center, then it's in the small van and, and that is the highest cost of the delivery, the person who actually brings it to your door. Right, and when you think I'm about, a, I'm, it, a, I'm amazed that Uber isn't in there in there on that one, Andy. Like, I well, mean, mate, these, this is the this is the thing. Like, I I I, I honestly think that there's going to be some major changes in this area. We'll end up with yeah. suburban-based pop-up delivery centres, right? Because they'll compete with Australia Post. Maybe offer a better delivery. Maybe there's amalgamations. Maybe whatever the case may be, because. It, that will become it's a significant cost to the business, right? It's a, a one eighth of the total cost of the supply chain, right? And it is the most expensive part. So that there's a potential great business opportunity in this sector. But if we then start to look at it and we go, okay, well let's let's zoom out and start to think about this, you know, conceptually based on how we consume. And, and I'll, next week, I'll bring all the statistics, which are just mind-blowing on, on our consumerism, completely mind-blowing. Uh, but it's growing, and it's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. I consider that to be fact. Everyone gets everything delivered these days. Uh, oh, I love it. I'm enjoying it. I don't... <laughs> you, 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 you'll end up with the children being delivered. I, I don't know. They'll, they'll probably, you, it's, well, they get delivered anyway, school buses, don't they? But my point being is this, this is growing exponentially, and... So the logistical operations, we may well see that, you know, Mornington's industrial area becomes a logistical centre and then businesses around those hubs then become very core businesses to the logistical operations that are supported because they need maybe a few smaller trucks to enter our smaller area in order for then smaller vans to be able to disperse, right? Because we can't have massive semi-trailers coming into the, the you know, the, the suburban areas. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Which then, and this is an interesting uh, fact that I learned today, is that Amazon over in the US, and it's very different over in the US, Amazon locations, these logistical hubs that they're getting on the outskirts, 
Uh, and this goes back to what we were talking about, you know, 12 months ago uh, in when we were talking about those logistical properties. They are buying these places, but then that the you would think, oh, that might devalue it because it goes from sort of quasi-residential to industrial. These prices shot up because then everybody wanted to be in and around next to Amazon supporting the, the logistical hubs because they're not just robotic warehouses. They're actually lifestyle places uh, for lifestyle uh, you know, participants with Amazon. Everybody wants to work for Amazon. So when you, and I know I'm, I'm drawing some large bows here, but when, when you start to think, this consumer behavior is here to stay and is only going to escalate and, and rapidly escalate. Then you're going to have more of this supply chain coming in, more people trying to figure out how this works, and you're going to have more of these logistical hubs in and around the greater outskirts of our areas so that things can be delivered at a substantial cost discount because that last, yeah. uh, last mile, 28%, is a significant slice of the pie and figuring out how to bring that cost down. And of course, Jace being in, in real estate, if you buy in an area, then the chances are that's going to go up in value over time. Then ultimately, you're, you're not just buying an expensive location. And if we go into here, we can see that the cost of the location is one of the lowest parts of the logistical operation then it's not too hard to imagine that we're going to have these, you know, quasi small little logistical hubs in and around our localised area, serving our area, creating jobs for the local area and creating business opportunity. So I think it's it's an incredibly, uh, it's incredibly interesting. Obviously, it's still very young and juvenile, but uh, Amazon's here. They do have more competition here than anywhere else in the world because they've got Kogan, they've got Catch, they've got but they've got, I think it's a wild amount, over 50%. It could be even as high as 80, I'm not sure. But I know it's definitely above 50% of the US market, which is crazy. Yeah. But out yeah. here in Australia, there's a lot more competition. So this, whoever can master that 28 is is going to be at a real advantage. And maybe it's not one player, maybe it's a combined affair. But really, really interesting because then I think, well, if you want to be in a good location from a resi real estate perspective, you'll want to be close to one of these logistical hubs at a point in time. So your deliveries come same day. So your stuff gets there same, same day. So my for the future is that I reckon that uh, when these places land, they'll actually increase the, the, the value of real estate, maybe not in, instantaneously, but over time because of the proximity for people to be able to get what they want. Well, it's, it's an age old uh you know foundational part of the growth story when it comes to real estate proximity to um infrastructure andy uh, the infrastructure is just changing right so what we're seeing right now uh certainly uh buildings offices uh homes apartments if they don't have access to good internet they're, they're worth less in rent uh, and ultimately, probably worth less into the future if you can't get internet there. Maybe there's a there's a, a two ends of the extreme where you where you don't want the internet, and then when you do, um, <laughs> yeah, <that's> right? <laughs> you know, but um, it's an interesting one. Certainly, the 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 things that you want to have proximity to potentially are going to change and and be more important for for different reasons. You're dead right. That's that's it. Listen, uh, I'm going to show a quick uh, comment, and this is this is the classic stuff that we're talking about. You know, when it comes to governments making decisions right now in New Zealand, the government has removed the policy removing the tax deductions of interest from property investors, effective at 27th of March. Um, so there you go. Uh, thanks, David, for for sharing, mate. Uh, fabulous. It that is the thing that we're talking about when it comes to uh, government uh, government. Uh, risk and exposure when the you know these policymakers at the end of the day it, it's it's insanely brain dead that um uh, unless the new zealand government's going to underwrite the cost of funding and put up a whole trillion dollar funding scheme for developers in new zealand to build buildings without pre-sales right um then that's going to fail that's going to that's doomed that is doomed right there. I'm, I'm, I'm going live and I'm, I'm saying it live. That is doomed because um, that is just one part of the mechanism 
uh, in a massive, uh, a massive functional process that they haven't even considered. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, funding's the issue. It's interesting. Uh, I went to China, and in China, you don't need any off-the-plan sales. Um, you, uh, the uh, buyer, uh, puts down a thirty percent deposit, and they release it to you as the developer, and you use the deposit to fund the construction um, of the building, and the bank and the government um, guarantee the funding to complete the construction. Now that's smart. That's that's smart, right? That's like so, you know, if you want a supply chain, stop being stupid. Oh, that's, that, I could well, go mate, on a rant there, but anyway, I won't. <laughs> it's it's a common question I'm asking when we're we're chatting with a lot of our in, investment teams and and economists, yeah. and, and and it's becoming more and more prolific the question around it, uh, which is at, at look we've talked about it again for a long time, uh, but just in a different form. We talk about Kerry Packer, uh, but. You know the the one of the key risks that we see and that we're starting to uh, rank very highly, whether we're looking at uh, whether we're looking at industrial, whether we're looking at commercial, whether we're looking at um, infrastructure assets, is is the political risk that's associated with it, because yeah. the, you know yeah. they do have the capacity to come in and really balls things up and uh, and over. Uh, extending their hand at times is something that they can. They, they've been historically very, very good uh, at overextending the hand at, at times, and you know it's a hard decision to make. And so I won't, you know, completely crush the politicians out there. But uh, you know, it's it's hard to factor in all of the various different uh, things that they need to weigh up at a single point in time. But the decisions are made far faster than what they should be quite a lot because they're made based on something that's happening and there's pressure to change it. And if you make decisions that big quickly, then there's a very small chance that you're going to get it right. And I think that we'll see them start to intervene. And I think somebody asked whether they will. I think it's almost yeah. a given. Yeah. Luke, said, yep. Luke said, do you think the governments will intervene? And uh, to uh, what extent, where and how, we don't know but they will start making noises about it before they do it because they're going yeah. to want to make sure that it, by doing it, they're not going to absolutely blow up their popularity because at the end of the day, it is a popularity hey, game. You, you, took, you took the words right out of my mouth. It's a, it's a popularity contest, Andy, and this is the thing. This stuff is not, unfortunately, sadly, you know, we could get into politics and my opinion would be that we should be voting parties in for 10 years um, and giving them a chance to actually do something significant, not bloody you know, four years where they can't even scratch themselves. But, uh, you know... We'd, we'd, we'd probably, probably still have eight different uh, PMs. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably be unpopular with that discussion. But, uh, Luke, the answer is yes, mate. Uh, governments will intervene, whether whether or, or they'll talk about intervening before they intervene. Um, but, um, you know, like in New Zealand, and thanks, thanks, Luke, and thanks, David, for your questions and your support on the, on the, on the chat today. There it is, you know, um, the government intervening in New Zealand, taking away tax deductibility for property investors, reducing the loan-to-value ratios. At the end of the day, knowing how the supply chain works, they haven't sold the fundamental thing, which is more developers, more development sites, um, and more funding at the front end to construct more properties. That's New Zealand's pro problem. Um, but anyway, uh, I won't go down that that rabbit hole. But hopefully, that uh, that indirectly answered uh, your uh, question, Luke. And the answer, both Andy and I do know, is uh, yes. Historically, they have intervened, and ninety nine percent of the time, in an average way, that has, that has adverse effects, and often doesn't even doesn't even achieve what they they were trying to achieve. It actually often back backfires. So. You know, the Australian government tried to do it many years ago, take away negative gearing. The whole supply chains collapsed. Rents went through the roof. It, it, the rents went doubled overnight. Stupid we, idea. We you also know? have to remember that coming into COVID and we, you know, one of the, 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 the and obviously not for people who are listening here, but financial ambivalence, uh, ambivalence is, is, is a pandemic in itself. Right, is that everybody wants an opinion, but nobody's really wanting to focus on it. And obviously, if you're listening here, that that's not the case. Uh, but God, I just completely lost my train of thought there. 
<laughs> While you're oh, yes, coming, into COVID, Eddie, <laughs> com coming into yeah. COVID, geez, that, I just had a senior moment. I'm not old enough for that. But coming into COVID, <laughs> we, and you're not uh, even drinking, Andy. <laughs> no, it's, it's water. Uh, maybe we should get back on the wine. But uh, uh, the we we need to remember that the government was really trying to prop up the property sector because the before the pandemic hit, they were saying that you know as Australia is potentially in trouble and they're trying to stimulate the economy. And the way that they were stimulating the economy was by trying to make sure that the property sector was was churning and was was going strong so they were actually pushing the sector and and pushing it quite hard because that was providing a huge amount of the gdp and providing a huge amount uh of uh you know balance or not balance because it was really one-sided but it was the growth sector of the economy and it'd be foolish to believe that just 12 months later that whole dynamic has changed so there's got to be a balancing act of kind of going, well, how do we keep construction? How do we keep the property sector going? Because it is such an integral part of our economy, which is the livelihood of all of us and, and putting money into our pockets. How do they, the question will be, how do they do that, but potentially curb, you know, property prices? Uh, and my question would then be is, well, should they really be intervening? Um, yeah, we'll and that's where they that's where they mess it up, right? They don't allow this sort of natural progression to happen. They get in there and they, you know, mess with it, and it shouldn't, you know, it goes in directions it shouldn't. But um, yeah, David, you're dead right, mate. The, all that will happen is the cost will be passed on to the consumer. Rents will rise in New Zealand to cover the costs um, of the property market, which which is we've seen in Australia, we've seen it in New Zealand. Ultimately, the can gets kicked down the road. Whoever's going to handle the can, um, unfortunately, it, it, yep, it happens. It goes to the pocket of the consumer at the end of the chain. And now old mate who was, you know, um, renting his property now has to pay 100 bucks more to rent his property because the, the investor can't afford it if they can't, you know, um, you know manage it as well. So, so gang, listen... Um, it's been a, a good conversation today, Andy. It's uh, it's gone on for a, uh, a bit longer than uh, I was thinking. We, we, you oh. and I thought, hey, maybe we have we, we would have a short one today. But uh, there's there's even more in this conversation, I think, than um, mm. than we thought. Hey, and I'm completely fascinated by this supply chain conversation that uh, that uh, you've brought up. Um, and uh, you said you alluded maybe we might be able to get somebody. Uh, on as a bit of a guest in coming weeks too, Andy. So that'd be kind of fun. That'd be awesome. Indeed, indeed. yeah. It would be yeah. one to look forward to, mate, because it, it's incredible. It's so much a part of our day-to-day -day life, but it's a beautiful summary as to how this can impact everything. And it really is, uh, I'm looking forward to it, mate. So I'll, I'll definitely get them on board. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, uh, as always, fantastic to sit here and have a chat with you. Uh, I always learn something. That's for sure. And I hope everyone uh, got a little bit out of today uh, with the segment. Uh, give us a shout out if um, if you want to suggest anything we might cover. We're always open to a bit of feedback. And uh, next week or the week after, uh, we're going to start bringing on a couple of guests as well. So thanks, everyone. Great to see everyone on today. And uh, thanks for the questions. Thanks, David, Allison, uh, Luke, Tony, uh, Harry. Uh, Facebook user, plenty of those. Jeff, Allison. Uh, there we go. Riley, good to see all of you guys on today. Anyway, that's it from us. Um, thank you, sir. And Enjoy uh, the rest of your week. Yeah. Take care, gang. Join us next Thursday. No, not, no Wednesday. Wednesday for <laughs> wealth, wealth, water, and wisdom. That's the one. <laughs> all right. See you. See you, Graham. Thanks, mate. All right. See you, Andy. Bye. See you all. Bye.